Well, welcome to the University of Sydney. My name's Clive Bulldock, and I'm, in Anne Green's absence, uh, acting head of the School of Physics, which is sponsoring tonight's talk. Uh, tonight's talk is on, uh, as you know, the subject of the winners of the Nobel Prize for Physics last year, and this is part of National Science Week, and this series of talks goes back for the last three years and hopefully will continue in the future. And we're very lucky that Kevin Barvel is speaking to us tonight. The event tonight is uh, supported by the Australian Institute of Physics, and we're closely associated with them. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Kevin, but there will be opportunities to ask questions at the end. Look, thank you, thank you very much, Clive. I hope people can hear me at the back. It will mean that the microphone is working. Let me say first up, it's an absolute delight to see so many people here in Science Week for a talk on science in, on a Thursday night, late night shopping. I'm absolutely delighted that people have this interest in science. I mean, it's just, it's really exciting. I feel as though I should shake someone's hand and welcome them. <laughs> Actually, now you're not made of antimatter, are you? You hope not. There's a lot of physicists in the audience that I can see, and some of them are actually very, very good at giving demonstrations in physics. But uh, if our friend here, tell him your name. Paul. I knew that. Paul, if Paul here was made of antimatter, we would have just done the most spectacular and probably decisive lecture demonstration in the history of the universe. So it would actually be quite good if I had a way of figuring out before I um, shook Paul's hand whether or not he was actually a, an interloper from a, a distant antimatter galaxy. And we'll see by the end of the talk that in fact there is a way in which I would be able, by experimental method, to figure out whether or not I should shake hands with Paul. But we'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. The talk is about Hunting for Antimatter, which is a catchy title. The task I was given, which I found is quite a difficult one, is to describe a rather esoteric piece of physics which resulted in the award of the Nobel Prize at the end of last year. Let me say at the outset, I did not win the Nobel Prize. I'm going to talk about the very clever gentleman who did win the Nobel Prize last year. So who are the dramatis personae for this occasion, there are three of them. All three physicists who won the Nobel Prize last year were born in Japan. The first of these, the gentleman called Yoichiro Nambu, who spent most of his working life at the University of Chicago. He received half of the prize. I've no idea what it's worth these days, but I think it's quite a lot. The citation for his prize was for the discovery of the mechanism of spontaneous broken symmetry in subatomic physics. So I'm already struggling. I have to tell you what do we mean by spontaneous broken symmetry. And we'll see that it actually leads us to some very interesting places. So bear that in mind. We're going to be talking about symmetry in nature. And we're going to be talking about spontaneously broken symmetry. The other two gentlemen that we're going to talk about tonight worked in Japan for their working lives. Their names are Makoto Kobayashi and Toshida Maskawa, and between them they shared half of the Nobel Prize. Their citation said, for the discovery of the origins of broken symmetry, there's that word again, broken symmetry, which predicts the existence of at least three families of quarks in nature. So I'll attempt to get across to you what that means. Nature is very, very fond of symmetry. Look at this beautiful six-fold symmetry of a snowflake. So nature obviously likes, and you will have many other examples in mind, I'm sure, likes to use the concept of symmetry in ordering the matter which it has in nature. Okay, now, it's not just inanimate objects like that. Humans also have an aesthetic view of what symmetry is. 
right? We have bodies which are more or less symmetric, and we value the symmetry of our bodies and the symmetry of the human face. <laughs> A thing of rare beauty. Well, almost. The human face is almost symmetric, as you can see. So in animate objects, symmetry is also a thing of aesthetics. I have to say at this point that there's no amount of mucking around with a computer graphic program which can produce an aesthetic uh, outcome for certain human faces. <laughs> Would you like to hold that bag up again? <laughs> up the back there. Okay, but so we all know what symmetry is. We all have an idea of what symmetry is. But symmetry has a more precise meaning in the laws of nature because people have tried to use the idea of symmetry in coming up with the underlying mathematical theories to describe nature that's most fundamental, writing down the equations that describe the laws of nature. Many of the students in the audience, and I'm sure others of you, may recognise what's written here on the coffee cup. Some of you may even own a coffee cup like that or own a T-shirt like that. Would anyone care to put their hands up? No one will admit to it. Those equations written on there are called Maxwell's equations. Maxwell, in the 19th century, James Clark Maxwell, took us along the first step towards a fundamental quest of humankind, which is the, to unify the various forces in nature and give us a deeper understanding of what they are and what, is, what we are made of at a most fundamental level. In our view today, we actually think of the fundamental forces that describe the natural world in terms of four forces. One is called the electromagnetic force, you're all familiar with gravity, but there are two others. Firstly, the electromagnetic force is the one that's responsible for building the atoms of which we're made. Okay, The idea of tiny electrons orbiting around, in some sense, the nucleus of an atom, of which there are many in our bodies. Something, however, is holding together the nuclei the tiny nuclei inside of those atoms. That's a force which is called the strong force, responsible for nuclear physics. And nowadays, we actually view that the building blocks of the nuclei of atoms are minute objects called protons and neutrons, which themselves are made up of smaller objects, which we call quarks and gluons. All of you will have heard of radioactive decay, that certain atoms will spontaneously fall apart. The force responsible for that is called the weak force. And the weak force we view these days in terms of a neutron inside one of the nuclei of one of the atoms in our body spontaneously turning into a proton and spitting out an electron and a ghostly neutrino. I heard a ghostly echo. People would like to be able to describe these forces which have very different properties in terms of some more fundamental understanding, perhaps a single force of which these are all different aspects. Maxwell, getting on now for 150 years ago, took us along the first step because the electromagnetic force is a union of the electric, for, electric forces and magnetic forces, which until Maxwell were thought of as two separate things. In the 1960s, people managed to unify the electromagnetic and the weak force. So we now talk about the electroweak force. And the quest continues to unify these properly with the strong force and indeed with gravity. The subatomic world, which is going to be Much of the subject of tonight's talk deals with that quest to unify these three forces. 
And that is the sort of work which was done by our three Japanese gentlemen, helping us along that road. We are going to touch, however, on the very large. The very large, of course, being the galaxies and so on, which we look at in the night sky, which are on very long distance scales covered by gravity. But it turns out that what's happening on the very small scales can actually tell us something about what's happening on very large scales. What do we mean?